Hello, and thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. My name is Billy Newman. And I'm Marina Hansen. And tonight we're out in Maui, and we're outside right now, and we're trying to try us out where we, we do some recordings of podcasts while we're outside and, and making some observations. And I'm hopeful that uh, that even with the wind and uh, maybe whatever else you might hear in the background, it's it maybe uh, a little more interesting to kind of go through some of the observations that we're making while we're making them. Uh, so it has a bit more of a like a live feel to it, but I think it's pretty nice tonight. It's cool. I think we're we're pretty close to a full moon. What would you say it is, Marina? I think that it may actually be full tonight. Yeah, it probably it it looks like it's going to be at least in the next twelve hours. So I'd say it's it's pretty close to being a full moon, and I bet it, it seems like about the right amount of time. It's been about two weeks since we had a new moon a couple weeks, or, you know, like a few weeks back. So it seems like it'd be right in line to be full. About now, so I guess this is the October full moon, which is pretty cool. What is that the is it the wolf moon or is that the November moon? Is it the no. the beaver moon? <laughs> November is the beaver moon. November's yeah. the beaver moon. Yeah. That's not very cool. <laughs> not my favorite. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that this one is the wolf moon. The wolf moon. And then September is sort of the harvest moon, is that right? I think so. I, I need to... There's a couple ideas around the harvest moon I remember hearing about where it's... Uh, what is it? It's like the first full moon after the autumnal equinox, like the fall equinox, September 21st. So if there's a full moon that falls after that pretty quickly, whatever that next full moon is, I think that was supposed to be the harvest moon. But also like the the other order of months says it would be harvest in September and then in October it'd be like wolf moon and then beaver moon and then I don't know what it is in December but it's nice being out tonight and looking at the full moon we're uh, up on a hillside uh, in western Maui which is uh, pretty cool and new to us and I think we're looking at a bit of cloud cover that's kind of moving around uh, the mountain over here and it seems like it's almost like that all the time like you look out there and it looks like it's raining up there doesn't it yeah I think that it is yeah it's interesting how like how it looks like it's raining up there all the time. I guess that's how how it's made to be a rainforest up there is because of uh, you know all the precipitation they get. And I guess that's sort of what I understand about like the weather pattern on the northern side of the island too. Is that like that gets more rain and weather than what we do over here on the uh, the western facing side of this uh, mountain over here. Yeah, up in uh, Kapalua where I work, it is rainy every single morning. And it seems to rain off and on throughout the day. Wow. Yeah, it's so weird. It was sprinkling on me when I got off work today. And I was going, huh, man, it's sprinkling. So it's kind of weird how it goes back and forth like that so much. But, um, but yeah, I guess uh, I guess just earlier this week was the Orionid meteor shower. Did you read up much on that? I think you were talking to your aunt about that and, like, how it was uh, coming into its peak phase just uh, a couple days ago. Yeah, I think the 21st and the tw- 22nd were supposed to be the peak days. Today's the 23rd, so that was uh, yesterday and the day before. Yeah, it's cool. I got to see like one of them go by while I was out doing some observations, but with the heavy moonlight, it's kind of uh, dampened, I guess, some of the dark skies that you would have uh, to, to really, I guess, enjoy watching a bunch of uh, meteor shower. Uh, or, you know, like watching the meteors come in through the meteor shower. But it's cool, yeah, with the Orionid meteor shower, I guess that's that's remnants of Halley's Comet that came through, like, back in 86. I guess it's its last pass. 86, 87 was its last pass through the solar system uh, when it was visible before I was born, so I might not ever get to see it. Um, and then um, uh, and then I guess what it was is that, yeah, like, as the comet comes through the solar system on its elliptical orbit, comes around the sun and then jets back out, and it's what, it's like 88 year trip around the sun, something like that. Um, I guess it leaves like remnants behind it in its dust trail. And so as the earth is moving around the sun and its revolution around the sun throughout the year, it passes through a couple of those zones where that comet has left debris behind. This is how we get most of our meteor showers, is that it's debris that's left behind by a passing comet. And so that debris is still just sitting out there in space, I think relatively without a lot of motion. And then it's actually our Earth that has the momentum as it swings through at its pretty high velocity as it's coming around the sun and it plows into that that rim or that, that, that little field of dust that's out there in that location. And so there's new dust for us to hit every year as we pass through that zone again. And that's how we get the Perseid meteor showers in a similar way. That's how we get 
I think the rest of the meteor showers that we're familiar with. But yeah, this set of the Orionid meteor showers uh, is kind of from that same position or that same reasoning is that uh, it was Halley's Comet back in 86 and then, I don't know, back at like uh, turn of the century before that that uh, left dust in the pathway out here and then now it's the Earth kind of colliding into it. And so the reason that we call it the Orionid meteor shower or the Perseid meteor shower or the Leonid meteor shower, whatever one we might be talking about, I guess, is because uh, that is the constellation in which it appears as though most of the meteorites or the debris, the shooting stars that we're seeing, are originating from. And so, like tonight, Orion's really not even up yet, so that's why we have to like wait up so late at night to start to see it, is because I think Orion would be rising out over this way, like above, uh, above the horizon over here, uh, to the east, and so that's why we'd have to wait till like midnight or later, but the idea is that they would kind of be coming or originating from a position sort of around where Orion is, sort of similar to how it is in the summertime when we're looking at the Perseids out of the northeastern sky. We have to wait kind of late at night for the constellation Perseus to rise up, and that's when we start seeing, uh, you know, the 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 meteorites, the shooting stars starting to come out of that location. It's kind of originating from the northeastern position in the sky. But you can kind of see them all over sometimes. It's, a, it's not like a perfect uh, way to delineate what the location of the meteors are going to be. But it's kind of cool. It's cool that we had it this last week. I thought it was cool that you got to mention it to some of your family that, uh, that they, was, they were asking about it. But it's a nice night though tonight. There's probably about, what, 30-40% cloud cover? I'm gonna turn over this it way. It is fairly cloudy up here. Yeah, it seems like it's just it's just that way on the island right now. Or it seems like we're kind of battling partly cloudy skies most nights. Maybe it's this time of year. But with the full moon, there's not really a ton of stars to see beyond like second magnitude. Like you know when you look out, like so we're looking up right now. We can see we see like Vega up there. We see Deneb, Seder over here, and then we see like Altair over there. And then you can kind of make out some of the fainter stars, but you can really only make out about six or seven in between, let's say, like, if we're looking at Altair and Vega with the full moonlight, we can see, like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight stars or so in between. And that zone right there is the Milky Way galaxy. So, like, all of that dense, rich color in the Milky Way right there is completely obstructed by the luminance of the full moon tonight. It's interesting how that is, so that's kind of like what... I guess you could call it light pollution. It's not really the same as light pollution, but that's, that's what you get with a full moon night when you don't get to see some of those dimmer, uh, richer, finer textured stars. But it's pretty, though. It is. The planets are really the most visible things, it seems like. Yeah, what planets can we see right now? So it's, I'm looking at Mars, definitely. Well, we can definitely see Mars. That one's looking really good. Very bright. It looks like down there, kind of on the horizon, is sort of where we're starting to see... Uh, Sagittarius. You know, when I was out the other night, I was at that uh, that star watching event, and I was really surprised because it wasn't even nine o'clock yet. But it seemed like like Scorpio was gone. I mean, I guess we're almost at November, you know. So it seems like it would be Arcturus is already pretty well set. It seems like, and uh, and it seems like uh, Sagittarius, that teapot, is tipped up on its side almost the whole way. But what's cool though is I think out there, do you see that one? If you take a couple steps over, maybe it was behind that telephone pole, but I think that that is Saturn out there. That low one? I do see it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Saturn. So right now Saturn is right out in front of uh, Sagittarius, which is cool. So if you look out and you're able to spot that teapot maybe earlier in the evening than it is right now, you'd still have like a couple hours into the evening or into the darkness where you're going to be able to spot Sagittarius and Saturn along with that. And I think... Maybe I'm wrong, but I think Saturn is still in retrograde. Like, I think it's still making its kind of retrograde motion up, and then and then it'll kind of go back into prograde motion again as it kind of continues on through Sagittarius. And then over the next couple years, it'll move on up to, uh, like, a, like, Capricorn over here. I think Capricorn's over there. Yeah, that's where... Like, I can kind of see that double star that's at the top of Capricorn, and that's where Mars was earlier this year, like this summer, when we were making videos and talking about it, watching it rise on the horizon up in Oregon. We were watching Mars at opposition a lot closer to that edge of Capricorn there, and that's all this distance here that we're looking at is how much Mars has transited in prograde motion now 
uh, since that time in like early summer or like you know early July I guess when we were first starting to look at it there so it's cool like looking at how much it's changed but we're we're getting to that point where uh, where Mars has like moved on a bit from its position opposition and now it's gonna kind of quickly change into like a dimmer star like you remember like two years ago when we were looking at Mars and Saturn together now Saturn and we see Scorp or we see Saturn in Sagittarius before we were looking at Mars and Saturn in Scorpio next to Antares. That was in like the summer of 2016. And, uh, and then we saw how much Mars had moved in those two years before it came back around to that same position in the sky. And so do you remember like how different it was over those two years? Like how dim it got for a while? I remember like looking at it with you in the morning one time and it just looked like a little speck. It was hardly even worth noticing. Yeah, it was really faint. It's interesting how much brighter it is now. It's yeah. really like through this year it's been so much more noticeable. Yeah, and that's that's that two year cycle, uh, like I don't know, some twenty four month cycle that that Mars is on, where that's how long it takes Mars to complete its uh, its movement, its prograde motion around the 12 constellations. <laughs> Do you hear that in the podcast? I think that's a guy playing a trumpet. Well, <laughs> some flavor in our outdoor podcast. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, after, over those two years, it had gone all the way around the ecliptic. So, so it had been in Scorpio two years ago in August. It had gone through Capricorn and Aquarius and Pisces and Aries. And then onward through Taurus and Gemini and Cancer and through Leo and all that. And then it had kind of come back around and then it came through... <laughs> <laughs> and then it came through uh, and passed through Scorpio like earlier this year and then is now up there. But that's what took two years to happen. And so when we're looking at it at Saturn over there, Saturn has made it just from Scorpio back to Sagittarius in those two years. And that's like the difference in the speed of motion that it is for these to transit around the ecliptic line. And it's super interesting to start to notice that. So Mars is two years, <laughs> Jupiter is 12 years, that's the next one out, so if you think there's the Earth, then there's Mars, then there's the asteroid belt, and then there's a huge amount of distance before you get from Mars to Jupiter. It's like, it's like many more times the distance in the solar system, so that, and that's a way of noticing it, really, is we have two years, so ours takes one year to get around the sun, we have Mars going around in two years we have jupiter taking 12 years to get around the sun and then we have saturn out there taking almost 29 years that means it's it, it was there about the time that i was born 29 30 years ago isn't that amazing yeah so, it's really cool having it like back in that same spot yeah it is really interesting well it's interesting kind of noticing like the the cycles the different timing and then and then sort of like historically what they mean a little bit too like um, like I think, well, I don't know. I think it was like Saturn. It's hard to focus with all this fun little jazz in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can hear it in this. Um, but, uh, I think it was like Saturn was kind of known as like, uh, Saturnine, I think is a word. And then there's mercurial. That's a word. I think Saturnine is like slow and lethargic and lazy, I think too. Uh, and then mercurial is like chaotic and fast-paced and like engaged does that make sense and so like if you think about it maybe in, in a sense of where those words had their derivation from saturn is the slowest moving planet taking 29 years to move around and mercury the closest planet to the sun is the one that moves around the fastest and it has the most chaotic type of motion it's really kind of harder to track venus is, is even more stable than that because it's well it's a lot brighter and it's a little further out from the sun and so it because it's an interior planet we see it kind of move um we don't see it move out to opposition but we see it kind of stay closer to the sun as it kind of orbits on that internal track between the earth and the sun it's interesting how it's been going so it's cool kind of noticing like where some of those things come from yeah, it's really interesting getting to observe it for so many years now or just being a lot more conscious of it than I had been in the past. And you really do get to to see in the motion of it like just how different they are and how far they move around. Yeah, yeah, I've been really fascinated by that. And, like, um, well, the other thing that I was noticing, too, is, like, so this year Mars 
So two years ago, Mars w- came into opposition and went into retrograde when it was in like Libra and Scorpio over there. And then now two years later, it's gone into opposition around Sagittarius and Capricorn. Really like Capricorn is where it seems to have ended up. And so you kind of notice like how far that is over that it had moved before it had come into come into opposition again and gone into its retrograde motion. So it must take like that. Or it's kind of interesting to think about how that would sort of play out like two years from now. It's going to be like out over here, so it'll be sort of a fall time opposition. Maybe two years from now it'll be, oh, or maybe two or four years from now, it's going to be like a Halloween opposition. So we'll have a big... Yeah, that'll be cool. Or, yeah, the red planet will be coming in. It'll be, it'll be just rising at the time that uh, we're coming into October. So we're going to have it coming into like October and Halloween uh, around the time that uh, we're going to see Mars rising up above the horizon line as the sun starts to set. So it'll be kind of interesting to sort of follow that over like a longer amount of time, but it's it's cool kind of getting to notice it a bit. What else do we see, Marina? I was looking over here, um, like up toward the moon where it is, and then I think like back, so if we follow the moon down, like over there, I think is I think that's where Aries is. Like Aries the Ram. That's another one of the constellations uh, that's in the zodiac or along the ecliptic line. And so I think that would be like the Aries area, right, right about where that cloud's going to overtake. And then down from there, we have Taurus that's up now. You see Taurus over there? I do see Taurus. Yeah. It's far enough away from the moon that I can actually make it out. <laughs> I can't really see... I can't really see anything that's right around the moon too well. It's so bright. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing we can see around the moon right now. Um, But it's cool kind of spotting over there. So I guess it's like Aries the ram, Taurus the bull. We see Aldebaran. And then I guess right now the Pleiades are where its tail would be are up in like a cloud. So we can't see that, but we can at least make out where it is a little bit. And then as we... So I guess that means that like Orion is probably getting close to coming up here on the horizon line, maybe like due east from us. That's kind of cool to think about. And that's sort of something I always remember from like uh, a couple years ago when we were here on Maui. It's like now that we're at the, the, now that we're 20 degrees above the equator, there's a lot more of the southern hemisphere that we get to see. And so that's why we get to see like Orion rise quite a bit higher, like almost like due east from us right now. And that's why we get to see further south from Orion, uh, we get to see like Canopus come up, which is really cool. Like the brightest star that's visible in the southern hemisphere sky that's not visible to the northern hemisphere sky. And so it's really exciting that we get to, I guess, kind of, or at least <laughs> for me, it's exciting. Yeah, it's really cool getting I think it's to fun. see a different sky. Yeah, and it's, well, it's really interesting. Like when we were talking about like the winter hexagon or the, the heavenly G, like one of those sort of more modern asterisms that's visible of uh, the collection of those really bright first magnitude stars that we see in the northern hemisphere. Do you remember when we were talking about that? It was like, uh, well, I guess it would start with like, well, like Capella up there that we're starting to see. And then it was like Castor and Pollux and then like Procyon and Sirius right. and then Rigel. And then it would come up to Aldebaran and then like over to uh, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse and, uh, it was, re- it was really interesting kind of like noticing that. But if you notice that, they're all kind of in this pattern. I guess right now they're just coming up over the eastern horizon. After that, yeah, like we're going to see like Orion. That's part of the, some of the stars I was just mentioning. But if you kind of continue that trail down of these really bright first magnitude stars, they're all kind of in this clumped zone over here. And that goes all the way down to Canopus, which is further south where we normally don't get to see it. So it's cool to kind of notice that all of these bright stars are sort of in a zone together. And I think that's still part of, like, the Milky Way zone. Am I right on that? I don't know. Wait. Where is the Milky Way right now? So we're talking about it. Yeah. So it goes... Like this section? Yeah. It would go over to, like, where Saturn is over there by by um, Sagittarius. So Sagittarius is, like, the heart of the galaxy. That would be, like, looking into the center of the galaxy. And then I think it would travel right up here as we see, like, Altair and Vega. Maybe right over there. And then it would cut over to Cassiopeia that we see up here. And then it would be kind of over here where we see Capella. And then there's going to be like a lot of it that cuts over here where we see like a lot of this band of these first magnitude stars uh, where we see like Orion and um, Taurus over here. And then as we cut down kind of to the south, if you kind of imagine like one big line like this here, that's going to be all along 
the Milky Way line, which is really interesting. So it's, it's really weird to start to perceive it as like it's Canopus in the Southern Hemisphere area and then Sirius and Procyon and Rigel and Betelgeuse and Aldebaran and Castor and Pollux and Capella and then like as it kind of like scoops up then we see and it's all like in one line but it's weird to kind of imagine it across the sphere of the earth and then we have like Cassiopeia and then uh, the like Deneb and Seder and Vega and Altair and then like over to the stars in uh, like Scorpio and the stars in Sagittarius over there are all part of like this Milky Way band that cuts all the way around so it's pretty cool but it's really interesting, like, looking at that and looking at how that that kind of works in the sky. But it's kind of fun. I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, well, I guess tonight we got, like, what, 30, 40% cloud and a full moon. <laughs> so we'll wait a couple months and then we'll be able to see um, more of the stuff or more of the stuff that would be uh, more prominently visible in the southern hemisphere. But I'm looking forward to getting to make some observations of uh, Canopus and of some of the constellations that we see in the southern hemisphere. I think it's going to be really fun. Me too. I'm really excited for some clearer nights here. Yeah, I think it's going to be really cool. I want to do a bunch of like uh, sky watching, like uh, naked eye observations with you while we're out here. But it's pretty fun. I like hanging outside and doing it this way. It's kind of nice like getting a point of stuff and like look at things. I hope it's going to make some sense when uh, when I listen to it back or listen back to it in audio. But it's fun. Thanks for being out here, Marina. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad we found this cool spot. Yeah, I think it's really nice being out here. And, uh, yeah, it's nice, nice, bright evenings in Hawaii. It's great. Feels pretty comfortable out. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. I appreciate it. But, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, for listening to this uh, recorded in the field episode of the Night Sky Podcast. I really appreciate it. So, on behalf of Marina Hansen, my name is Billy Newman, and thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. <laughs>